So you're interested in learning some basic woodworking, or maybe just want a fun class to help explain and solidify what you already know. Well then, welcome to Worth the Effort Woodworking. In this introductory to woodworking episode, our premiere in a new series of classroom style lessons here at Worth the Effort Woodworking, we've got some ambitious goals. Hopefully by the end of the video, you'll have a good grasp of how pretty much all woodworking tools work, and more importantly, why something a lot of craftsmen still struggle with to this day. We do have a small exercise, so you're going to want to grab a few supplies. Just a little hunk of wood, just a little piece of scrap is all you need. You're going to want a small chisel. I prefer a half inch, but anything close to that will be fine. You're also going to want some abrasives to sharpen it with. Uh, you'll want some method of holding the work down. A simple clamp will work just fine, but I'm, you're going to see me use an appliance called a bench hook, something we make here at the shop. Uh, this will allow me to use this God-given pizza endowed power to actually hold the work down. So, I do encourage you to participate in the video, so if you need to, pause it, go grab the supplies and come on back. Afterwards, we will get busy. Now, real quickly, we're going to be using a chisel in this little exercise. And I need y'all to understand something. This is probably the most dangerous tool in an entire woodworking shop. Because basically, there is no guard whatsoever. And the way most people get hurt is by holding work in one hand and using a chisel in the other. And I think you can see why. A chisel is a two-handed tool. Either both hands are on the chisel, where the front hand is guiding the direction and the back hand is providing propulsion, or one hand is on the chisel and the other hand is on another tool. Because it is very hard to hurt yourself malleting a chisel, the back of the chisel like that. Okay? So, you have to be very, very careful with the chisel. Again, I'm quite confident more people get hurt and cut with a chisel than any other woodworking tool out there. Having said that, we are going to do something in this exercise which goes against that rule. We are, you're going to see me using a bench hook, and I'm actually going to hold the work in one hand and use a chisel in the other. But when you see the exercise, I think you'll understand this is actually a fairly safe exercise. This is one of the few exceptions, but I'm starting you out in this work, introductory woodworking doing an exception. I just need you all to understand that from the get-go. Always be careful around a chisel. Now, what I want you to do is take your scrap piece of wood and holding your chisel like a pencil, except tilt the handle away from you so that the far corner is what's going to be touching the wood and we're going to drag it across. Then I want you to take the wood and going across the grain, I want you to try and draw some straight lines. I want you to pay attention to how the chisel feels going through the wood. How easy it is to for you to control the direction. Try reversing it to have the bevel go the other way. Try and draw lines as close to the other, each other as possible. Notice that you have control. It's actually fairly easy to draw a straight line because the bevel just wants to go straight. But try going in the same groove a couple times. Do you continue to get work done or does it just kind of stop working? Experiment. Just draw a bunch of lines going across the grain. I want you to feel the sensation. Feel how it's kind of bumping up and down as you go across. Thump, thump, thump. You can see it in my chisel handle how it's just kind of dumping down. The, the hardness of the grain wood as it goes through varies. Just notice the amount of work you're doing and the type of work that's getting done. Next, I want you to do the same exact exercise except go with the grain. I want you to try and draw a straight line. Are you controlling where the blade's going or is it kind of following what the wood does? How hard or how easy is it to draw a straight line? Are you getting much work done at all when you're doing this? Can you draw a line right next to the other one, or does it just kind of pop in? If you go in the same line, multiple strokes, does it keep working, or does it just kind of stop working? Feel what's happening at that cutting edge. Now I want you to take the, hand, the chisel on both hands, where the front's going to provide direction and the back's going to provide propulsion. Go ahead and lay that chisel a couple millimeters from the end, maybe a quarter inch, 
and just give it a little push at a slight angle. I want you to see how much work you're getting done. How straight the lines are. How smooth the shaving is. How much work is actually happening here. I mean, that was what, four or five strokes and I'm about a third of the way through the board. Now try the same exact experiment except going across a grain. Lay that blade down flat, just a, maybe a quarter of an inch from the edge. And give it a slight push forward at an angle. Notice this clean cut. How much work you're getting done. How easy it is to draw a straight line. I mean, I don't know about you, but this, is, this kind of cutting is just almost perfect. Straight, ready to go straight to the joint. To the glue up. Now I want you to take that chisel, lay it flat going across the grain, and if you have a mallet or something, go ahead and give it a strike. If not, just lean on it really hard. Now I'm going to strike it a couple times, right in the middle of the board, really driving it in. I want you to notice after a while how it stops going down. I mean, I can keep hitting it and it's still not going to go anywhere. But I also want you to notice one other thing. How much work got done? Notice no wood escaped. All we actually did was we severed the fibers on one side and compressed it on the other. No wood left this board. It's all still in there. So this was a brutal strike against the chisel. And this right here has more pressure against the edge of the chisel than just about anything you can do in woodworking. Which is why when you're chopping mortises you tend to dull the end quite a bit. Now I want you to do the same exact thing, just come to the edge, maybe a quarter of an inch in, and go ahead and give it those same strikes. Notice what happens. The wood kind of breaks off now, and we can continue to go down until we get through the entire board and actually go into my bench hook, but you get the idea. The wood has an escape path this time, so now it made a clean cut and the, the power kept going, being transferred into the board to continue to sever the fibers. Now let's do the same exact thing, except this time going with the grain. I want you to stick it right in the middle of the board, just like we did the first time, and give it a few strikes and see what happens. The thing we have to understand as woodworkers is that in its 400 million years of existence, 10 times longer than grass has been on earth, trees were never meant to be furniture. They were never meant to be housing material for anything other than bugs, birds, and squirrels. A tree was never meant to be square, flat, or gloss smooth. Its only purpose was to transfer nutrients from the ground to the leaves and back and forth, maybe to get that canopy up into the high enough to do some good. And it's doubtful that will ever change. Despite all the genetic manipulation we can do, I mean, we can make a three-tailed glow-in-the-dark mouse that spins web right now, but it's doubtful we will ever really modify trees that much for one simple reason. A scientist could go through several generations of mice in a single year much more much more generations of flute flies but it is inverse whenever we talk about trees because a scientist might only get one or two generations of trees in their lifetime so it's unlikely we will ever have anything change wood will always be cantankerous fibrous really difficult to deal with unlike other man-made materials such as metals and plastics which we can modify to our own advantage so we are stuck with having to deal with the peculiarities of wood, so we have to modify it the way we interact with it to get anything done. What we just experienced, moving this chisel over, around, through, and against this piece of wood, should give you a good example of how all woodworking tools interact with wood. Okay. So we have those two boards here and you can see that the chisel went in about a third of the way on each board and then because the pressure was building up so much on the inside, remember, the wood did not escape. It had no escape path like when it had, we were chopping down here going across the grain. The wood could escape so we could keep going with no danger. Because there was no escape path, that pressure built and because wood is very weak going with the grain, Notice that crack is not straight along the side. It actually followed the pattern of the grain. Well, 
that pressure built up until the wood just snapped in half because of that weakness. Whereas when we went across the grain, I could hit that as hard as I want, and eventually the chisel stopped going down because the pressure of the end grain, which is very, very strong, pushing against it, uh, caused it to stop going down. And if you think about it, a tree grows lengthwise. So the tree grew like this, and that has to hold a lot of weight pressing down from the canopy. So all the tree strength is going up and down, which is why it compressed instead of split the board all the way across. Now let's take a closer look at what these other cuts did. Whenever we were taking the edge going with the grain, I cut several times going this way, and basically it just kind of stopped working. But you can tell by those grain cuts that it was following the pattern of the grain. The blade had a hard time hopping over the grain to go from softwood to the other side of the hard uh, late growth. Uh, so it kind of followed the path of grain by going on the edge. But when I went across the grain, it was very easy for me to draw straight lines. In fact, it didn't matter which way the grain was curving, it just hopped across them. And I could feel it as it was going from softwood to hardwood to soft because the chisel was vibrating a little bit. But also notice that whenever I severed fibers from both sides, because grain is very weak going this way, all of a sudden those things were just popping out on their own. I mean, they just separated very easily. So basically, if I severed the fibers on both sides, there was nothing keeping that wood in the cut, and it just popped out. What we just experienced here was basically every single cutting tool in the woodworking world. Either wood blades are going across grain, they're going with grain, or they're going through grain in a variation of going cross or with the grain. Uh, you are either cutting on the tip with the edge, or you are planing with a flat. Every single woodworking tool has to deal with those kinds of cuts. So let's take a look at a lot of other examples of tools. I have got two saws here, identical with the exception of the teeth, the part of the saw that interacts with the wood. Here's a close-up picture of those two. I'd like you to pause the video and analyze the picture. Discuss it if you're in a group. Come up with a reason why a manufacturer would make identical saws yet have different teeth. I want you to think, conceptualize, and reason a good explanation. It's a skill you really need to develop as a woodworker, especially as you design and build your own furniture. When you've come up with an answer, come back to the video and we'll discuss. Now these two saws epitomize just about every single woodworking tool out there in terms of function. Now some of y'all might have caught on to that one saw has a few more teeth per inch than the other. That's a very good observation, but it's not really pertinent to where we were going with this discussion. What I really wanted you to focus on was the shape of the teeth, the part of the saw that is actually interacting with the fibers. I wanted you to notice the difference, so let's talk about those real quickly. Did you notice that one of the saws, all the teeth came to a point? So that you had a bunch of teeth coming up, and every other tooth had a little bevel on it. Well, the reason why you saw every other tooth as a bevel, because the bevel on this tooth was on the other side. So basically the bevels would interact on either side. So as the wood saw went through the board, it would slice a little bit to this side, a little bit to that side. And then the part of the fibers in the middle would either fall out. Because if you remember, when we went across the grain, when we sliced it down one side and then the other, those fibers, because they are weak going with the grain, just kind of popped out. The problem was that when we went with the grain, it tended to track and stay on the side of the softer wood, so whenever it rolled up next to hardwood, it would come back in. So we had a harder time controlling the direction of our chisels. This saw right here is exactly like if we had one chisel facing this side, and then the very next tooth, we flipped it around, moved it slightly over, and placed it on the other side. So basically the saw became a thousand chisels alternating their bevels so that they could slice across the grain just a millimeter on either direction. That was called a cross-cutting cross saw. It was designed to go across grain. The other saw, you notice, all the teeth were kind of flat. like that.
And yes, they kind of went either way, but the cutting edge was flat. That was like if we held a bunch of chisels in line flat across and we saw this direction. And if you remember, when we laid the chisel down flat and pushed across going with the grain, it got a lot of work done fast and it made a nice smooth cut. But if we did that same thing going across the grain, it just kind of split it apart because once again, wood is weak going with the grain. And because we have a wedge here, it kind of separated and took advantage of that weakness and kind of splintered all over the place. This kind of saw is called a rip saw and it's designed to go with the grain because of the cutting edge. So as a practical exercise, I've got my two saws here. I've mixed them up so I don't really know which is which. I placed a board in my vise and I put it at a slight angle because I'm going to saw straight down as per gravity. And that way these, these saws will have to go across grain if they want to go straight down. So let's just see the difference that these two saws have and you decide which is a cross cut and which is a rip saw. So here we go. I'm going to hold it with a almost very little pressure and absolutely no pressure pushing the saw plate down. Just the weight of the saw is actually going to do the cutting. So here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen slices to bottom the saw blade out on the cutting edge. I also look at the saw line and it is kind of a little bit wavy as it went across the grains. Put this one down, pick up the other one right next to it, same amount of pressure, same amount of everything. The only difference is the cutting teeth of the saw. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. Eight strikes saw pushes to bottom it out and I look at the saw straight cut and it is slightly straighter than the other one. So just by the performance of these saws that they cut twice as fast and a little bit more accurate, I'm going to assume this is the rip saw. So I look at the teeth, sure enough, the teeth are cut straight across. Now let's do the same exact experiment, going across the grain with the same piece of wood. So here we go. Now here's, because I now know which saw is which, I want you to listen and you can tell the cutting action that's happening. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six I bottomed out on the twin screw. Now I come over here, grab this saw. I know this is the rip saw, so that's a wrong saw for this cut. You hear the sound difference? It's just shredding the wood. And it's not actually, it, it's shredding a huge trough it does the same amount of work, but you can tell it just did a lot more damage on the back side and this side right here is a lot rougher. So you, you, just by that fact that these cross cutting teeth are just, I mean these rip teeth are just not as good for going across the grain. It more shreds it than slices it. Whereas the cross cutting teeth, because they are points, you can hear the difference. They are kind of slicing the wood. So now let's go look at some more power and hand tools to look at their cutting edges to see how they interact with the dead tree corpses. So I have a miter saw here. Probably one of the first power tools a lot of DIY homeowners buy them for themselves. One of the bigger power tools out there. Uh, designed specifically for making cross grain cuts. Cross cut. You would never put a board in going this way. They're always going to be lengthwise. And because of that, we can make an assumption here. Let's take a to closer look at the blade in this thing. Now because this saw is designed to go across grain, if you look closely at the teeth, every other tooth has a slightly different angle. Now is isn't as extreme as the hand saws that we use. Those are generally about 15 degrees. These are probably only about 5 degrees. But they do alternate. And if you look at the bevels underneath, they're slightly different, more like those hand saws. 
This blade is designed specifically for cross cutting. Now the problem is it's a 10 inch blade and a lot of people think that they look just like the blade you see in your table saws. And a lot of table saw blades are designed for rip cuts so that the teeth are cut straight across all the way around. Have you ever been to a job site and you look at the end of boards and you see that they're all shredded or burnt? Well guess what? They probably have the wrong blade in their chop saws or miter saws. Now here we have a small contractor table saw. Table saws are designed to do, do both rips and cross cuts, depending upon if you're just ripping something long this way, or you maybe put a cross cut sled on it, or use a miter slot to go across the grain. It can do both. And a lot of people will swap out blades for if they're doing a rip cut or a cross cut. A lot of amateurs end up doing cross cuts with rip blades or rip cuts with cross cuts, and they don't get their exact results they want, and they get frustrated. Me, I've only got, I'm cheap, I'm only, I've only bought one blade, so I have one blade in here that has two teeth that are at angle, and then the middle tooth is a raker in each one of these five tooth sets. So the middle tooth does ripping action, and the outside four kind of do cross cuts, a slice of grain. What that means is this saw blade doesn't do rip cuts great, and it doesn't do cross cuts great, but it will do both of them halfway decently. And for me, this is a rough tool. It's not the last blade that's going to cut those fibers, so that's okay by me. There are other tools that are the same way, where they do good both cross cut and rips, and their blades compensate for that fact. Uh, now, if you ever, are ever in a milling place where they're, where they're basically making boards and they're just slicing all day long, I guarantee that the blades they have in their saws are going to be ripped, because that's all it does, so it might as well be efficient doing it. Now here's a bandsaw. These teeth, it's going to be a little bit harder to see in the picture the angles. I'm afraid you're just going to have to take my word for it, but if you ever look at a bandsaw, go look up close in the teeth. The bandsaw blades, there are a lot more variations in them for the simple reason of how we use bandsaws. A lot of times we're using bandsaws to resaw thick lumber down to thin lumbers, and generally that is going to be a long rip cut as you cut the board in half. But we also do cross cuts. And one of the main things people buy bandsaws for is the fact that they can cut curves, which means you're going cross and rip all in the same cut. But if you analyze it really closely, I have a board right here. If I were to draw a circle on this board, for example, drawing a big curve, you will notice that very little of it, maybe up top and right here, is a true rip cut. Most of it is a variation of a cross cut coming around. So when you buy a general purpose bandsaw blade, a lot of times they are going to be predominantly a cross cut teeth configuration. And if you've ever been cutting a circle on a bandsaw, you notice that sometimes it's a little bit faster and easier to cut going across the grain. And then when you get down to the ripping situations, it slows down big time. You saw in the example, a cross cutting saw in a ripping situation cuts a lot slower. So we have to adapt to it. I guarantee a lot of those people that are using band saws to mill trees and stuff like that, they're doing dedicated rip cuts so that they put a dedicated rip cutting blade in their saw for the simple reason it's easier, it's faster, it's le it requires less horsepower and it gets the job done better, smoother. If you've ever done a resawing job with a dedicated cross cutting blade in a band saw, you understand why it never seems to cut straight, it kind of wanders around. Well, that's that sensation when we were dragging the chisel along the rip section. You notice how it followed the grain more. Where the, when we laid the chisel on its side in a ripping configuration, it could care less which way the grain was going. That's why a dedicated ripping blade and a bandsaw will do a lot better work in a long rip cut. Now let's throw you a little curve. Wood turning. I've got a bowl right here. The tree in this one actually grew lengthwise. So I'm actually spinning the tree on its side when I'm turning it. So am I doing a cross cut or a rib cut? That's the reason why bowl, uh, wood turners tend to have so many radically different shaped cutting edges. From skew chisels to spindle gouges which have a very narrow flute in them to bowl gouges which have a thick flute into them. All these allow us to change the cutting angle of the blade to interact with the wood in the proper way. And bowl turning is really complicated because you're doing both cross cutting and ripping at the same time. 
but if you're turning a spindle, which is like this handle laying on the side, the tree would be along the side, you're mainly doing ripping cuts when you're smoothing out sideways and doing cross cuts when you're going with grain. That so that way you present the tool that you're using, something like a skew, either sideways for like a ripping cut or cross down the point like when you're doing cross cut. All, the same, the information transfers even when you're going round and round and round and round. Now let's look at some common hand tools, specifically uh, my marking tools. I use a knife a lot of times when I'm making joinery. But a lot of those cuts are going across the grain. Even my dovetails, when I'm slicing down a board to make the dovetails, I'm somewhat going across the grain, so the knife makes sense. Now, if I'm cutting the baseline for that dovetail, a lot of times I will use a gauge. These modern day wheel gauges I really do love, but they are a slicing tool, so they're actually a lot better going across the grain than they are going with the grain where I have to really focus on keeping it pressed hard so it doesn't hop over or follow grain path and vary, vary the uh, line. A lot of people will take a traditional marking gauge for making long ripping marks uh, and file the pins differently so that they don't interact with the grain as much, more like a ripping saw blade. Other tools, hand planes. If you think about it, a hand plane is a ripping tool. It's just like holding the chisel flat against the wood and pushing. If you go across the grain, a lot of times it shreds the wood. Now, do we use hand planes going across grain? Oh, yes we do. But a lot of times when we're doing that, we shape the blade in a very radi uh, with a steep radius, so it somewhat slices across, almost as if you are taking a knife and going across the blade and then letting the severed sides lift out in the middle. But most of the time we are taking long passes going with the grain. Now can you do a hand plane across in grain, cross grain or something like that? Sure. What do we do? We lower the angle of the blade and most of the time we skew it also to lower it even further so it's making a slicing cut going across the grain much like the knife or the teeth of my cross cutting saw slicing it. Uh, so we modify how we use a blade tool to interact with the wood, whether it's a cross cut or a rip, even on simple tools like a hand plane. Now I'm going to throw you a curveball. Take a look at these drill bits. You tell me which one doesn't belong. Which one is not a drill bit used mainly for woodworking? One of these is also designed to cut plastics, metals, uh, even concrete, uh, depending upon what the hardness you get. So pause the video and in your group discuss and figure out which one of these does not belong. If you guess the gold one, you're right. You notice it has a point in the middle. This drill okay. bit is a general purpose drill bit designed to be used with PVC pipe, metal, plastic, basically homogeneous materials. Something that's uniform, that doesn't have the grain direction, the weaknesses and the strength of wood. It can be used in wood, but it's not ideal. All these other ones, such as this paddle bit, have little spurs on the end and a point in the middle to keep it tracking straight through the wood, and the spurs will slice the cross grain, allowing the flats to handle the ripping or carrying out the waste in the middle. Even brad point bits such as this one right here, cross cutting spurs on the end, ripping in the middle. Even Forster bits, you have, look, analyze the spurs on the side. They are common to points with bevels just like a cross cutting saws and the flat in the middle is just like a ripping saws. So all of these drill bits, with the exception of the gold one, are designed to deal with both cross grain and ripping cuts. I hope you're beginning to see a pattern here. Pretty much every single woodworking tool ever invented, with the exception of maybe laser cutters, which are more science fiction than anything, is basically some way of holding a chisel at a certain angle and presenting to wood a certain way. So if you can understand that, basically if you can figure out how to sharpen one of those tools, most sharpening all the other tools will generally make sense. So. From here, today we're going to learn also how to sharpen a chisel. Now, I need to take a side note. Sharpening in the woodworking world, especially if you follow online forums and stuff like that, is a lot like a religion. 
basically you have people that advocate using oil stones, water stones, or the scary sharp method, which is basically just sandpaper glued down to some kind of flat substrate like marble or glass. It really, you also have lots of contraptions like uh, Tormex or Work Sharp or stuff like that. A lot of people advocate all, one way is the best way. Honestly, I don't care. All, basically, all of them are just a way of abrading metal in order to get two planes that meet for infinity, which is the definition of sharp. Sharp tools are something we really have to focus on as woodworkers. We need to be able to sharpen our tools because you're going to be doing it often. The reason why is purely safety, not, not so much the fact that it works better, it's a safer tool. A sharp tool is a safe tool. If you are having to put a lot of muscle forcing a tool through wood, that's when things go wrong. If you can more focus on letting it glide through and controlling it instead of doing the forcing, it's a lot safer tool. So, we need to figure out how to sharpen them. Now, my thinking is if you can figure out how to sharpen a chisel, because a chisel is the foundation for all the woodworking tools we've discussed, you could probably figure out a way to sharpen everything else. Now, a good place to start is defining what is sharp. In my mind, uh, sharp is basically two lines that meet for infinity. Now, some people say sharp is when it shaves a hair on your arms, but to me, that's kind of scary. Notice I got all the hair on my arms. I don't do that one. I will basically look straight down the edge and if I don't see the edge, I, can, I might see the top of the chisel and the base of the chi bevel of the chisel, but I can't see the edge at all, I know it's sharp. If I see any glint of light there, that's dull because now you have something that is round. If the back of the chisel is straight and the bevel of the chisel is straight, there's nothing here for light to refract off of. It will be either bounce down or bounce away. None of it will bounce back. But the moment you add curve to it, there is a spot for light to bounce back. Now it might not but be much light because that's what that's why it will show up as gray instead of a bright point. If you see a bright point, you know you've got a really dull tool. But if it's just a gray line, you know you can need to resharpen it. And how do you resharpen it? Well basically if that's the back of the chisel right there, you just remove the metal until you get back to two lines that meet for infinity. And it should look the same whether you're looking at it with a naked eye or a 10,000 magnification microscope. Now, when you buy a chisel, one of the first things you have to do is polish the back. Some people say flatten the back, and I'm one of those people. I will flatten the entire back of a chisel because I find it makes a better working tool. And this will take me a good hour on most chisels to flatten the back to a mere finish. I will say this, the more money you spend on the chisel, generally they've already done that flattening back, flattening of the back for you so there's less labor involved. So you might spend more money but you don't, you're having to put less labor into it. Once you got that flat back of it flat, all you have to do is match that flatness with a bevel flatness. So that's what we'd spend most of our time sharpening is bringing that bevel down to remove the curve at the end. So let's go to the stones and I will show you my method of sharpening. In our school, basically I keep a little sharpening station in the corner because I don't like spending much more than 30 seconds to sharpen any of my hand chisels or gouges or any planes or anything like that. I hate sharpening. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Now the setup I have in the school is because we are a school. We have diamond stone set up. I basically have 150 grit or the equivalent. You have 1,000 grit equivalent, 4,000 and 8,000. The reason why I chose diamond stones is because it eliminates one step in the normal stone, pro stone sharpening process of having to flatten the stones. Basically, the students can just come up here, squirt them with water and get to busy. If I were doing this for myself, I would not have invested all the money in these diamond stones because as of right now, they're kind of pricey upwards of $100 per on some of the grit levels. Uh, my preferred method and the one I recommend people try out is buying a combination water stone, a 1,000, 8,000 grit. That's pretty much all you ever need. If you really do damage a blade and you had to really grind off a lot of metal, that's where I would grab sandpaper. Sandpaper can get really expensive if it's all you're using to sharpening because it gets torn and you have to replace it quite a bit. But for the occasional use or when you're flattening the back of a brand new blade, 
220 grit, 150, 120 grit, just to get it started, and then moving up to the water stones you have uh, is a good, effective way of doing it. Uh, I've had this 1,000, 8,000 grit for going on 10 years, and up until last, uh, about two years ago, when I bought these for the school, that's all the sharpening I do. I also keep this 8,000 grit out because I have found that even the, though the manufacturers tell you the super, 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 extra, super fine diamond stones are the equivalent of 8,000 grit water stones, they aren't. Uh, this actually does polish it a little bit better. So I use this, this for my last little step. Once again, when you buy a chisel, you probably need to spend about an hour, sometimes two, on the bigger chisels, flattening the back and then putting a mirror finish on it. I prefer putting a mirror finish all the way down the back, but most people will just put a mirror finish on the last inch because that's pretty much a lifetime of use for most woodworkers. We want that mirror finish at the cutting edge because that is the back plane that now we need to meet with the bevel plane. Now I've got a chisel right here that is dull. I'll show you a quick picture of it because you can see a glint of silver on the edge. That's, that edge should totally disappear. So let's sharpen it up. Now for students, I'm a big fan of using jigs. Uh, jigs basically use uh, the interior angles of a triangle to, for you to figure out your desired angle on your chisel. Now most chisels are, uh, for my students, I sharpen at 30 degrees and that's a very common angle for things like planes. What angle am I talking about? I'm talking about the angle of the back of the bevel, uh, back of the uh, chisel with the bevel angle. That comes out to 30 degrees. Uh, it's a very durable angle. Now you can lower that angle and a lot of people you know, on TV shows and stuff do that one because it will give you an easier cutting edge and sometimes a little bit smoother cut. But the lower the angle, the less durable that edge is. You can cut skin with tin foil, but that edge is not going to last very long. You can also cut wood with a positive 90 degree angle as long as those two angles meet for infinity. That's the definition of a scraper. Scrapers cut it about 90 degrees and they cut all day long. It's just those two angles are not rounded over. They are sharp. So I typically uh, sharpen my students' chisels at 30 degrees. Now an easy way to figure that out, 30 degrees, is with a simple ruler and using the 180 degree triangle trick. Most woodworking jigs for sharpening operate on some kind of way to hold the chisel at a certain angle and it either rolls or glides on something. And an easy way to determine what that angle will be is basically turning this into a triangle where you have a 90 degree action up here and then your base action right here. Because the interior angles of all triangles equal 180 degrees. So if you have a 90 degree one, you know that your other two angles have to also equal 90 degrees. So if the triangle we are using has one 90 degree angle, which is the definition of a right triangle, and both legs are the same length, well then that would mean both of these angles right here would be the exact same. And 90 minus 180 equals 90. You divide that by two, and that means both of these would be 45. The thing is though, we need ourselves a 30 degree angle. So doing the same thing, we have 90 in one corner, 30 in another, 90, I mean 30 minus 90, because we have to give that back to 90, means that we need this angle to be 60. And here's what's kind of cool, and what makes this very easy to find out. 60 is twice 30. So, Basically, if we wanted to, we could have this top line right here being X and this bottom line being 2X because 30, 60 is twice 30 and that should be our 30 degree angle. So if somehow you can just step off two times on the base where the height is here, that bottom angle will be 30. The other way you could do it and simplify it is trust that the Chinese, when they gave you instructions on the side of it, they did their math properly because they will give you a protrusion from the edge that will give you 30 degrees. And this one so happens to be 30 millimeters. 
So according to guidelines were written on the side of the jig, if I want 30 degrees, I would measure out 30 millimeters. This is a Chinese made product, so they do things in millimeters from the edge of the contraption to the edge of the device. Now I will say this, I uh, like mine a little bit lower than 30 degrees. So for my preferred angle, I made me a simple jig that I only had to worry about doing the math once and every time after that one, I just bump my jig up to the edge and I get going. That's why it's very quick to set these things up. Tighten up the screw and then we get busy. Now what I have right here is the equivalent of 150 grit, 1000 grit, the 4000 grit one disappeared somehow and then I have 8000 grit over here. Equivalent to uh, water stones. What I will do is I will give you a spritz of water. Now because I don't have to reshape this edge I just need to put the bevel the sharpness back on. I'm not going to go to the worst harshest grit. I'm just going to go to this 1000 grit equivalent move it back and forth a few times. Now I'm pressing all my pressure on my fingers. You can tell by my nails changing colors. None of my weight is on the back. All this does is go backward and forward. If you put any weight on back here you're going to tend to rock it left and right. And then just move it back and forth maybe 10 times just a little bit. And then you want to feel for a burr. It burr is a little ledge on the back where the metal is folded over because I've actually ground past that dullness on the end. At which point I just go to the next grit and the next grit will remove the past burr and add a burr of its own. Generally the burr is a little bit shorter but a little bit more upright and I'm having to take a few extra strokes here because I am missing the 4000 grit stone and there we go. A little sharper, a little more, a little more upright. That's when I will remove it from the jig and the last thing I do is I like to remove the burr on the my water stone. Just work it back and forth a little bit to remove that burr and I, you now have a very sharp edge. Much sharper than any scalpel out there. I like this method simply because it's fast and I'm lazy and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Literally you come over, it takes me a few seconds to put it in a jig. I walk over, 10 strokes, 10 strokes, remove the burr, get back to work. Now, I like having something set up. If all you have is a piece of marble that you bought at Home Depot for a couple bucks and you have glued down paper, that's fine. Just set it aside. Anytime you need to sharpen, you got your doll's just starting to get dull. Your tool's just starting to get dull. Go refresh it really quickly. It's a lot easier to maintain an edge than it is to add a new edge. In fact, I very rarely go to the stones. That's generally just to repair my, my damage. Uh, most of the time I just reach underneath my workbench and grab this piece of leather right here and I strope it just like a barber would strope his razor before giving somebody a shave. You just find your length bevel, drag it across a few times, remove the burr, get back to work. Sharpening should not be something you need to spend too much time on. Now with that little bit of knowledge about sharpening, just the chisel, I hope through a little thought and extrapolation you can figure out how to resharpen all the other tools. Now a lot of tools uh, like modern day uh, table saw and miter saw blades, most people either just replace them or send them off to get sharpened because those carbide tips are just way too sharp, hard to deal with. But all your hand tools, your saws and stuff like that, there's just variations to what we just did here to sharpen those up. So it's all easily doable from, a home, from your home. Now in our next episode we are going to be using all these same tools, the chisel, the mallet, some way of clamping down your wood. I'm going to be using a hold fast next time but just a little clamp will do and a slightly bigger piece of wood. So if you want to collect those for, your next, for the next episode go ahead and do that now and be prepared. We're going to work a little bit more on the interaction between the tools and the wood in a fun little exercise that you'll enjoy. You probably end up throwing it away afterwards, but you'll have fun uh, and it, you will learn quite a bit more than what we've covered today on the interaction between the tool and the wood. I hope you enjoyed this video and were able to take away something new from it. I've always enjoyed teaching, which is why I cashed in my retirement and savings to open up this little woodworking school. But good intentions alone won't keep the school alive. We need support from individuals like you. So if you see value in a place educating our next generation of woodworkers, 
please consider liking and sharing the video, maybe subscribing to the channel. And if you believe more videos like this would be beneficial to you and others, maybe visiting our website, worththeeffort.com, and on our support page to learn about other ways you can support the school. And one last thing I want you to remember, it is always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun. Oh, and don't think I'm going to let you get away without assigning a little homework. I got two tools here. Take a good hard look at them. Pause the video if you need to. And you tell me, are these designed for making rip cuts or cross cuts? And if so, why would certain cuts actually burn the wood and singe the tool? Leave your answer in the comments below.